Thank you. I wish that I was the one who invented this unique innovation. This is the ultimate combination of the wonders of nature and the innovation powers of human beings. This is a dried cod. The cod swims from the Barents Sea and down to the Lofoten and Vesteron area to spawn, and there the fishermen uh, catch it, and then it's hanged to dry in the natural environment of northern Norway. And the product that you have that then is truly fantastic. It's high in nutritional value. It's, it weighs uh, next to nothing. It has an unknown expiry date. And the best of all, it's embalaged in its own skin. And the reason why this event, the reason uh, that we have this product is a unique event that happens outside Lofoten and Vesteron every year. And this codfish, this dried codfish, it has uh, been the central pillar of the Norwegian, uh, the building of Norway as a coastal nation for thousands of years, both economically and uh, culturally. And the reason why this happens is oceanographic features that takes place outside Lofoten and Vesteron. Everything that's above this line is in northern Norway. It's above the polar circle. And here you have two currents, the North Atlantic current and the Norwegian coastal current uh, streaming up along the Norwegian coast. And outside Lofoten and Vesteron, there's a very narrow continental shelf that squeezes the, these two currents together. And that generates an upwelling of nutrient-rich water from the depth outside the continental shelf. These nutrients are lingering in the water masses during the winter, waiting for the light to come back. And when the light come back, comes back, uh, a biological production of world class is generated outside Lofoten and Vesteron. The seawater is filled with nutrients based on the oceanographic features of the area. And that gives the fundament for a huge phytoplankton bloom that feeds zooplankton. And zooplankton is the main diet for the cod larvae. And if the cod larvae doesn't make it to an adult cod, it is eaten with the rest of the plankton and small fishes of other fishes, and seabirds, marine mammals. And on top of them, you find the top predators, like killer whales and sea eagles. And then you have one more factor, and that's the fishing vessel. And on board the fishing vessel, you find a human being. And this is a very important human being. This is a fisherman. And I'm born and raised in Lofoten, and my ancestors were all fishermen. And I also lived of the ocean, but as a marine biologist. And Lofoten is an epic, um, and Vastron as well, is an epic area. It's filled with these small, uh, uh, totally white beaches, and you would think it was in the Caribbean if you hadn't put your foot in it, because it's freezing cold. And I have a daughter who's five years old, and every summer I take her, I'm not really sure if it's, if it's like a very nice thing to do, but I take her swimming. And I tell her that, uh, <coughs> Well, you have to experience the same things that I experienced when I was a child. Blue lips and goose pimples all over my body because I was <laughs> freezing to death. But uh, when we go to the beach and she put her tiny toe into the ice cold water, I tell her, do you know that now your tiny toe is in the same medium as all the great white sharks in the ocean? Because there are no borders underwater. And then, if she managed to keep the toe a little bit longer. Um, it's also a sad thing about that, that there's no border underwater, because her tiny toe is not only sharing the ocean with all the great white sharks, but also with something else. And uh, last year, last year we went 
uh, on a beach cleanup on the north side of Lofoten. There's no people living there and we went to a beach that is, is not a road going there and it has been totally cleaned four years ago. And it was a very ambivalent experience because on one side I was really happy that I was there taking some of this marine litter out of the ocean. On the other hand, my eyes teared up when I saw my little girl next to this enormous pile of marine litter. And I was thinking, what are we leaving behind? In one short afternoon, 15 people, including five children, collected 2.5 tons of marine litter on this beach. And the same evidence comes from all over there, northern Norwegian coast, like here in Tromsø, from Bo Eide, who's organizing a lot of coastal cleanups uh, through his uh, Clean Coast Initiative, from the Bear Island in the Barents Sea, where the Vega brothers have an expedition where they both surfed and collected marine litter, and even from Svalbard, where Gerig Bing Gabrielsen, a professor at the Norwegian Polar Institute, saw this polar bear with a fishing gear stuck in his identification mark. And it do make you sad, doesn't it, to see how human-generated litter is causing suffering in uh, innocent living beings. And the big litter that we see, it also have, uh, have other effects. Because the big pieces of plastic, they are grinded by the natural forces of the marine environment into tinier and tinier and even tinier little pieces of plastic. And those tiny pieces of plastic, when they get smaller than five millimeters, they're defined as microplastics, and they blend in with the microbeads that you, when you use peeling creams or toothpaste with microbeads, um, put into the marine environment. And this marine litter, it comes from everywhere. It comes from all of us. It comes from the other corners of the world, and it comes from our own communities. And every year it's estimated that we, as a global community, um, generates four to 12 million tons of marine litter that enters our oceans. What we do know is that it affects all of the food web, from the large animals that are on top of the food chain to the very base of the marine ecosystem. The marine ecosystem that together with the marine environment provides important ecosystem services that makes it possible for us to live on this planet. The water masses, they trans transport biomass and energy all over the world. They are central in the climate systems on Earth. They provide transport, energy sources, and not the least, uh, they produce food for us. So we know that it has an effect. We know, we know it's a lot of, of it, but we do not know enough. When we talk about the base of the food chain, research has shown that the zooplankton, that the cod larvae like to eat, is capable of consuming and digest, not digesting, but consuming because they are not able to digest plastic, but they are able to uh, consume microplastic. And if it is so that they do this in the marine environment as well, it's a risk that they will transfer this microplastic together with the hazardous substances adhered to the microplastic particles upwards in the food chain. It's accumulating in the marine ecosystem. And it will reach all the way to the top predators. And do you remember who was on top of that list? Well, it's us. And the food that we put on our plate. We need more knowledge on marine litter. There is a lot of good research done lately. It's a growing attention on the effects of microplastics and Scientists here in Tromsø at the Fram Center is doing a lot of good work, but together with all the researchers other places in the world, they need more funding to find out new methods for measuring how much is it really of this microplastic and all other kind of marine litter, and they need to know more about the effects. And we need more knowledge on the sources of the marine litter and the distribution patterns. 
but most of all, we need solutions, and we need it now. If you take the marine litter problem and look at it at large, you can coarsely divide it into two parts. It's the part where you have the influx of potential marine litter from land-based sources. In fact, 80% of the marine litter that is found is probably uh, generated by land-based sources. And then you have to deal with the marine litter that is already accumulating in the marine environment. And what I want to talk about is that I think that we have to put more attention on the part where we have the influx of marine litter. This is a map uh, made by Gridda Andal for the next UN report on marine litter. And it shows where in the world you have um, plastic waste production. And I will not go into detail on this map, but as you can see on the left, uh, there is a hotspot in Asia, along with all, the, all other kinds of hotspots, such as the population hotspot. And the same goes for the pl plastic waste tra trends, and to put in more in detail, the mismanaged waste control or waste management. And um, these countries in Asia, they are not, I don't think that they are less worried about us when it comes to waste and marine litter. But many of these countries are middle income countries that are developing at, at a rapid speed. And uh, the people living there, when they get more income, they want the same lifestyle as we have, of course, I guess, but maybe not. And with that also comes a very unhealthy and little sus uh, sustainable um, consumer pattern. So that the lifestyle that they are generating very fast is not followed up by a um, well, the waste management systems and capacity is not developed at the same pace. Legally, it is so that the coastal state is responsible for its, the waste and the pollution they are producing. But I want to point out that I think morally and, uh, and ethically, the Asian hotspot of marine waste production and potentially marine litter production is a global responsibility. Because have you thought about where many of the things that you have in your houses, where they are, pro are produced, is in Asia, right? Many of those things you have, they come from there. So I think that it's unfair to put all the responsibility on them because they are producing stuff that we use in our lifestyle. But I want to talk more about solutions. So let's make a space for a solution. And in this space, in the top uh, left corner, we have the sources. And next, very close to it, you're close to the source. Then you move out to the coastal zone, and then the continental shelf, and then the open water. And the means that we already have for taking care of this uh, marine litter is waste control close to the source in our own houses. Then if you go to the coastal zone, you will have beach and coastal cleanups, and then you go out to the continental shelf, and then you will find initiatives like fishing for litter. And then, in the very far corner, you have the open water where, for instance, the ocean cleanup is put. And taking a business approach to this, I don't think that um, it's a very good idea to only invest in ocean cleanups, because the effective uh, means that you can have, they are better, the, the more efficient, the closer you are to the source, and also the investments and the costs are much bigger when you go down to the open water. It's really expensive to create mega structures that should be in the open water. So waste control, that's the most important thing that we can all do. We can do, start with ourselves and to buy things that are not wrapped in plastic. We can recycle our, our garbage, and we have, can put pressure on our uh, different, uh, where we buy our food to get the producers of food and emballage 
um, to find other materials. And we can also put pressure on the global leaders to take responsibility for the Asian hotspot of production and mismanagement of waste, for instance. And I would like to say that uh, I'm very frustrated that we have so much focus, not on the influx, but on the getting rid of the accumulated uh, garbage that you find out in the ocean. And I think that if you do that, uh, it becomes a Sisyphus work. Every day, we as a global community generate 25,000 tons of marine litter. And that means that it's nobody is able to collect that 25,000 tons of marine litter every day. We will get more every day. But even if they are able to, we will be back at square one. So I think that the best thing that we can do to take care of the ocean that we are so dependent on is to move a lot of the focus and investments from taking out the accumulated marine litter to reducing the influx of potential marine litter. And I would like to say that I hope that some ecopreneurs are picking up the message that the dried cod is sending. That they can find something that is biodegradable to embellish our food and stuff in. And also, when the cod is traveling down from the Barents Sea and to Lofoten to spawn, I think that um, it's, they have a, it's something we can learn from that as well. Because it's said that the cod is, they have a leader cod that show everybody, like all the rest of the cods, where they are supposed to go. So maybe we can uh, take that as a message in a bottle. And all of us have the knowledge and awareness that is needed to change our behavior so that we don't produce more waste that could be marine litter. Because that's, in the end, the only 100% safe solution for reducing the influx of waste to the marine environment. And we have to do it now. Thank you. <laughs>